All right, all right. We are back at the podcast studio today. We are in. Uh, we're doing a virtual one. We have a very special guest on. We have Brady Nash, the founder and CEO of BNG Team, and uh, now the founder of Nash Capital. Um, and I've known Brady for a few years now. Brady, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Excellent. You have a great story, so uh, I want to dive right into it because one thing about your story that is even better than most is. You've had a successful exit, so we'll get there during this conversation. But it was a, it was, it was a little touch and go there for a while. It was a little stressful there for a while, as as every entrepreneur uh, knows. So, how did you get started? A lot of while, you know. I used to have long, beautiful, flowing <laughs> hair, and I was like sixty pounds lighter. And then, you know, the journey takes its toll on you. You know. Yep. <laughs> but so, it was Mui Guapo. Mui. <laughs> so where did it start? When you let's go back to when you're 18, 19, 20 years old. I'm sure that you had an interesting story and run there. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, to kind of fit within the half hour. Kind of giving your listeners some background. You know, I grew up uh, in North Dakota uh, in a bunch of small towns. You're talking with schools like where the classroom size is, you know, 20 to 30 kids a class. Uh, both my parents were teachers, coaches. I grew up in a trailer home, you know, a good part of my life, um, you know, kind of moving around. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be a pro athlete. And when you realize, well, I'm good, but I'm not that good. What do you want to do? I had no idea. So 2004, I went to North Dakota State University. Uh, I went to Bison, um, where like Carson Wentz came out of, Trey mm -hmm. Lance. Uh, we've got, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mo, uh, uh, not Eric, I know a bunch of his brothers um, playing for Tampa Bay right now, linemen. So, mm -hmm. you know, definitely a football school there. But anyways, uh, you know, 2004 went as an 18 year old going into nursing, not because I wanted to be a nurse. I just didn't know what to do. My parents are like, hey, go into the medical field. You know, um, there's always going to be a need. I'm like, OK. <clears throat> and uh, that's that's where, um, you know, I was out making friends and recruiting people to play poker like cheap entertainment, $10 buy-in, have pizza pop. I don't drink alcohol. I just loved, you know, meeting people, making friends, you know, my freshman year. And that's where I got recruited to um, a network marketing company um, where I really got my, my vision, my eyes opened up to entrepreneurship, uh, opened up to finance, opened up to how wealth is created. Read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant. Yeah, those were kind of the books that like really like opened my mind and my ideas and vision to, oh, like there's a path here to creating wealth that I just honestly never thought it was something that would be in the cards for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started seeing how wealth was created and made, being a business owner and investor and not just trading time for money, um, creating leverage, creating scalability, um, not just getting paid on your own efforts, but you know, building a team. Um, and then doing something once and getting paid over and over, so recurring revenue. And, you know, so I got involved in network marketing and I was really good at that. I was someone, you know, I'd say maybe one of the few people that legitimately made, you know, pretty good money doing that. Because I, I, I'm a people person, you know, so recruiting came natural. I believed in the vision, so I could convey that vision, you know, to people and people bought in. But what I realized was, <laughs> it's like lots of people have like desires or they're like, oh, I wish I could be a pro quarterback or a pro basketball player or a baseball player, or maybe, you know, I wish, you know, I want to own my own business. Um, lots of people have the vision, but they don't have the discipline, the ambition, sure. the drive to do it. And, you know, it's not just being motivated one day. You got to have something that's able to have sustainable consistency for that to work. Right? Every you single day. Have one day. If you wanted to be have a six pack and be in super good shape, you can't just have one day. You have a low calorie diet and you work out hard. It's like the lifestyle. It's consistency, right? Well, same thing in business. If you want to have a business, you can't have one day you work hard and take care of clients and you sold and made a couple of deals. Like, can you consistently show up and deliver excellent service, support, have a sales machine, and 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 be able to do that? And so. Um, so a lot of people love the idea of, oh, I want wealth, I want money. Um, I want, you know, to have passive recurring revenue, but would they put in the effort consistently to build that? The answer is no. You know, th there's a reason 95% of people are employed or self-employed, and there's only 5% of people are business owners or investors. It's not because, um, 
you know, it has to be that way. It's the reality of the desire, discipline, and structure for people to do it, you know. So you read um, so, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you start to get this vision. You yeah. start to understand all these principles that you just mentioned. Um, now, your mindset was in the in the right spot. I mean, it sounds like, you know, and again, the no drinking helps that mindset too. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, what, what, what I saw with network marketing was I got sick of recruiting people where they said, yeah, I want this, I want to do it, and then they literally do nothing. They don't sell any products or services. They don't, you know, get other people to sell any products or services. They do nothing. And so, to make a long story short, we got recruited uh, to market for a company that was going from check collections to payment processing. And that's where I learned about payment processing and learned about, oh, these businesses pay to accept credit cards. You know, I'm 19 at the time, and like, I didn't know that was a thing. Explain more, and uh, you know, guys like, how'd you like to get paid every time someone swipes a credit card? <clears throat> didn't know that was possible, tell me more. And so you learn about how that business worked. This is 2005, mm -hmm. so in September of 2005, we got involved in payments, and I saw a way that, oh, I can build recurring revenue without trying to recruit a bunch of other people and sell them on doing it. I can go actually work with the people the entrepreneurs, the people that had already jumped and taken that risk, they were already running a business, I could actually just help their business be successful. Meaning mm -hmm. I could come in and help them take payments and lower the cost around getting their money, which really feels like an additional tax because when you end up taking payments and now they're you're losing another two, three, four percent, it seems on these things, it's like another tax, right? Yeah, sure. And so I'm like, man, how can we do this better, faster, <clears throat> cheaper, more economically and you know, provide a more robust solution and better support and you know that's uh you know uh that was september of 05 so we started doing that um and uh what happened was i was you know I, you might know ryan goodman yes um you know so it was him and our other business partner tyler and uh ryan tice had dropped out of school as well um and we all you know were kind of going after this payment processing thing and uh, I was more of the sales guy. So a lot of the revenue, like that was just my forte. I was like eight, I was like 89% of all of our sales I had in my hand and whether I directly did it or all of us. So what we did was, and this is a part of it was, but those guys were like as close as family to me. They're like my brothers. We had to be honest with ourselves about our skill sets and how do we build a team and a system. So <clears throat> Tyler ended up doing a lot of the back end, you know, administrative work at the time, paperwork, he had help on customer service, terminal downloading. Ryan Goodman was really good on the phone. So Ryan would try to call and get me big meetings, like, hey, places you can't just walk in. Sure. Right? He got good on the phone, and he knew if he could get me in the door, I could, I could close it. And then Ryan Tice, um, again, he wasn't great at in-person sales either. He got really good at the internet. So he started creating videos, online marketing. He was actually the first one for us to create um, like YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. This was like mm, 2006, um, mm -hmm. 2006, 2007. He started creating uh, videos for um, um, boxing like credit card terminals. And the reason that's so important was when you went to eBay, when these businesses realized that banks were like overcharging them and people were trying to charge them $100 a month for a credit card terminal that cost $400 and they were going to get stuck in a 48 or 60 month lease. Like it was just crazy the money that was yeah. going around. Um, that when they'd search, you were the first ones that would come up. We couldn't pay for advertising. We had no money. We we're a bunch of college dropout broke kids, right? We didn't come for money. And so we had to like be smart. And so he learned that with the algorithms, like he could be number one by doing these videos that weren't that much. It's like, here's the terminal. This is how you plug it in. This is yep. how you run a sale, like simple stuff. But that wasn't the point. It was all about the traction. And so when you'd go type it in, then we were offering either low cost terminals or we offered it for free with a merchant account, just like you could get a free cell phone. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we had to be scrappy. I mean, we ended up, you know, we had, we had a house, we were renting out to a bunch of college kids. We, we joked for two years, we probably had moved 30 people in and out of houses <clears throat> and you know, our college friends were renting rooms from us. We had a house, not because we had money, but we were trying to leverage the investment. You know, we, we were young and we looked young. So yep. you're walking into business owners, you know, and dealing with payment processing. Hey, I need your bank account, your social security number. I need to know where you want your money to go. Yep. And I'm going to move your money for your business. I mean, it's not something that, <clears throat> you not know. It's not an easy it, sale at that age. Yeah, yeah. you got to be able to c connect and build trust. <laughs> 
Um, and, you know, we started doing that, but we had to be scrapped because we weren't going to have more resources. We weren't going to have more money than the multi-billion dollar companies we were competing with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where... <clears throat> So what happened was the people we were selling for that kind of turned us on to the industry, they wanted to recruit me. They were offering me some small ownership, but they wanted to cut out my business partners. And um, I wasn't for that. And I just started to not really trust them. Sure. I thought it would be better if we went out on our own. And I realized we had built like 90% of their whole company. I'm like, guys, we're doing everything anyways. Let's just go out and do this. So um, that was like May of 2007. So January 1st, 2007, we formed B&G, Beekler and Ash Goodman. We went out on our own in like May, June, but under our contract, they were supposed to pay us for two years of our residuals, but we couldn't sell those accounts. We knew that, like, that's fine. We've got time to rebuild, we'll sell new accounts. Well, they decided that, oh, you're leaving, you want your money, come and get it, we're not gonna give you a dime. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I say that is, in trying to tie it into your <clears throat> podcast, when I was in network marketing, I was at the point of making, you know, six figures, right? Five to 10 grand a month I was building up and growing. And we restarted to go into payments. I started building in payments. We, you know, probably, I think we had about 11, $12,000 a month residual. Um, like if we did nothing that was coming in. Sure. And then we said, hey, we're gonna go out on our own. We thought we'd have it for two years. They said, you're not gonna get a dime. But now we had to assume that we had more money. And so again, we had to start all over. So this is now like once, you know, the second time yep. now. It's the only time I've ever missed a payment in my life because we literally lost all of our income. And we ended up settling, uh, they paid us for four months instead of that year. Um, but I got them to remove any non-compete language. And well, I had sold 90% of all those merchant accounts. So what happened was after those four months, I went and re-signed like 90% of them. Sure. Which, because they know me. I came in and here's the situation and so I got all those accounts. So actually even in this journey, it's 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 tougher than that and I'm, and I'm gonna tell this more in detail than I think I've really ever told because I want people to understand, you know, the end result, we'll get to the exit, which was a nine figure exit and all that great stuff in this journey. But it was a complete dog fight the entire way and nothing ever worked as simple or as easy as it should <clears throat> ever. Never does. You know, and so I, w I told the company that I settled this six-figure lawsuit based upon getting the non-compete done, that I could re-sign these accounts if I could get new contracts signed. They said, yeah, yeah, no problem. So I settled this lawsuit saying, hey, we'll get four months, I'll go back and re-sign them. We did that, I went back and re-signed, <clears throat> I had like stacks, had like 280 applications of like 320 merchants. Went to submit all these after these four months. They said, well, we can't let you take all of these accounts. I'm like, why not? Well, it's literally almost this whole portfolio will take them out of business. I'm like, how is that my problem? I literally yeah. settled this lawsuit. We walked away to do this. You said I could, now you're saying I can't. They're like, well, we thought you were talking like maybe 20, 20 or 30, not 300. I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah, they should have I mean, just paid you out for the two well, years. I'm like, and I just, I was so frustrated. I did all this work. I spent all this time. I set up the thing based upon what you told me. I went and did all the work, and now you're telling you won't take take them. They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, okay, that's fine, but you can't tell me that I'm in contract then on those accounts because you're saying they're not <laughs> my accounts. So I had to go find another competitor, a partner that essentially their competition, and I went and re-signed all of these. Well, then they started to see all these merchants move. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't do that. I'm like, yes, I can. Either they're my accounts and you move them and you pay me for them, or I'm gonna move them over here. You can't have it both ways. And I've yeah. offered to keep them with you. So they ended up terminating him and moving all of the accounts over to us. Wow. So, but it took about a year of that. Uh -huh. And it ended up even being more. And so it was, the amount of times in the journey, right, where you trust people and even you, when you have things in contract and writing and people don't honor it and they yeah. know it. And uh, they just feel because they're bigger than you, have more money than you, they can just squash you. I mean, it happens all the time. And so I had to learn how to navigate these waters with these very large companies, private equity backed, have you know hundreds of millions of dollars of resources, sometimes billion dollars of resources and compete with them, you know? Um, and we had to do it through relationships, through trust, through delivering, 
You know, it's just like how you build your business is, uh, you know, Tom, you're just an awesome guy and people love you. I guarantee you that's why you've been able to be in business and people work for you and, you know, you get referrals and you take care of them. And anyone listening to this that's had any amount of success in business, you know it to be true too. Um, and so, yeah, so it kind of, you know, as we got into payments and volume, we really became problem solvers, you know, because we connected with people. We were honest. We did what we said we we're gonna do. If we made a mistake, we owned it, we apologized and we made it right and we got a lot of referrals. So we didn't have a bunch of money for marketing, it was all word of mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, all these business owners know each other, so you save them a bunch of money, you know, you, you tell them what you're gonna do and then you deliver or even over deliver and all of a sudden they're telling their friends and so sales got really easy. I could walk in and name drop or they were already calling them for me. Sure. Um, and we just kept taking that money recurring revenue. And instead of, to give you an idea, when I was like 21, if I had paid myself like a salesperson, my residual was a little over 50,000 a month. I was paying myself five. Not that five grand a month is bad, but if you're a 20, 21 year old kid, say you want 50 grand a month or you want five grand a month, yeah. I think most kids would say like, give them the 50, I want, my, I want my Ferrari, I want my big house, I want my yep. boat. Yep. And you know, we were still kind of like reinvesting everything. And so I started building teams, started recruiting salespeople. So it was this constant reinvestment process into, do I want it to be about me and everything I'm selling? Do I want to build an organization? And so I realized I had to check my ego at the door, humble myself and say, Brady, it can't just be about you. Um, at some point you're going to get tired. Even if you think you're the best salesperson in the world, which I'm not, well, let's just pretend you were, can you outsell two good salespeople? Probably not, but maybe, let's say you could, but you probably can't outsell three or four or five or 10 or 50. So do you want it to be about you or do you want to build an organization? I'm like, these are me having conversations with myself. I'm like, I want the organization. Then I yep. said, you need to get better and you need to you know, learn how to build other people up, not yourself. And so I really transitioned into recruiting and then training and empowering and building out everyone else and put yourself kind of behind. Um, and that took time. We started doing that, but it took time. It was you're spending money. You know, it's their, you know, 18 month to 24 month to 36 month plays where it's like, oh, we're not going to get a return till then, but we're doing it. And so it was this grind of constantly, you know, we couldn't afford to hire real employees for a long time. And I remember we got up to about, it was like, 7500 a month, I think. And then myself, Ryan and Tyler all said, we really need to get the sales guy. Like we just need a full-time person. We had independent salespeople, but it's tough to build a business when you can't guarantee they're going to sell and you can't really hold their feet to the fire because they're not employed. You just sure, hope they sure. send you deals. And so there's a guy we knew that was a rock star sales guy. He's still one of my best friends, Scott Heinle. And we all took a couple thousand dollar a month pay cut from like 75 to 5,500 so we could go hire him and give him, hey, you're not, you know, we're gonna give you a base. You can come and take nothing. Sure. And that was one of the best decisions we ever made because then we had a guy that was full-time professional sales guy coming in helping build, you know, and he was still was pretty much our number one sales guy all the way through up until when we even sold. And you know, he helped set the standard, you know, what professionalism looked like. Uh, yeah, was just the, that standard, right? We had competitions. He set where's that bar at. Everyone was trying to, you know, beat him and knock him off. So it kind of rose the tides. And but yeah, in this journey, I mean, I could tell you in payment processing, working with vendors that promise you the world and they seem great, and then once you sign a contract, you got numbers and quotas, and then they underperform and they still want to hold you accountable, even though they're dropping the ball. You know, there's I won't mention names. I don't need to get into another lawsuit. No. Um, but there's a vendor that uh, I remember thinking, we only had to send them like, it was like 10 deals a month. We're doing like 70, 80 new businesses a month. And essentially it came to like 10 a month. I'm like, oh geez, I could fall out of bed and do that in the morning. Sure. And we had an aggressive contract and we had them, we had moved over like, uh, it was like $80,000 a month of residual to this First Data company. Uh, not First Data, they were a partner with them. And uh, so they were gonna give us good buy rates, they had some cool technology, we, we wanted to sell it. Well, once we started doing that, they were terrible. Like, it'd be like me selling you doing the paperwork and then they'd mess up your whole file, your money's not being deposited right, your rates weren't set up right. I mean, it was just a disaster. And so what was happening was 
all of our merchants were having bad experiences and we were doing what we could, but we were limited because we're still depending on them to provide certain levels of the support service and technology. And it was just a dumpster fire over and over. Well, then our salespeople are getting frustrated. They're getting discouraged. I mean, it was literally crushing our business because everything was taking two or three times as long. We had to you know, keep apologizing. We were losing our reputation. But yet we had a contract that said if we did not send them 10 accounts essentially a month, they could take our whole residual. That's like 80K a month. It's mm-hmm. like, oh no. So we're pushing back on them. They're like, well, this is what the contract is. We think we're doing fine. And it was a really bad spot. It's one of the most uh, stressful. I just felt like we could lose everything and I didn't know what to do. So we ended up negotiating and had to pay them a couple hundred thousand dollars to essentially get out of our contract. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm like, guys, what does that tell you? I'm willing to pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars to not send you business where we have good pricing. That's how bad you guys are. That should say something. Sure. And uh, yeah, that that was a rough time. You know, um, but we had to work through that, and I felt responsible. And now we have employees and people with families, and we're probably around mm, 20, 25 employees at that time. And so, yeah, you know, and then <clears throat> you kind of know we ended up, this is 2018, 2019, we had this dream for this building, this BNG building, and our rent was around 15K a month. And we had this dream that we had back when we dropped out of college about building this mini Google, right? Like we wanted a building with slides and, you know, that was fun and that our employees would be proud of and their families. And so when we went to finally build a building, we had all these ideas. Um, And I remember the guy had to convince to help build it because we didn't have all the money. I had to sell him on the vision and the dream. And he he believed me, he believed in us. And uh, uh, he put the upfront money he helped finance the construction and ended up being, you know, over a $12 million building. And, you know, we're looking at hundred K a month, um, versus like 15 and we didn't have the money at the time, but I said, we will get there where we can support it. And, uh, he took that leap on us and, you know, we've gotten some national recognition on that building cause we got three floor slides. We got three slides. We got a basketball court. We have a whole weightlifting gym. We've got the holodeck with the floor and the ceiling. You can change the entire environment of the room. Um, how, but, how many square feet is that building? It's like 30, just shy of 34,000. Wow. But it's a super high in quality custom building, custom <laughs> rooms, conference rooms. I mean, we've got uh, the code table. is uh, It's all keyboard keys, and there's like over 100, 150 different hidden crossword like puzzle names throughout the table. It's you know, the code, the, the walls are all code from our various software products that we developed. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's just an amazing, fun building. And the, and the point behind that building wasn't, hey, look how cool we are. It was we wanted to show that our employees matter, talk is cheap, and before we went and built these big houses, that we gave it to them first. Sure. And forever in our time, before we went and built these big houses and like places and all the things, which there's nothing wrong with that, we wanted to put them first because they might not have a movie theater. They might not have a basketball court, but we could provide it for our whole team and their families to have access to. And that's why we did that. And that's why it was so fun. And it was a great recruiting tool. And so the example I, I, I give is I can tell my wife and my kids I love them, but if I don't back it up, it doesn't mean anything. And so words without action are meaningless. So I can tell our employees we care about them and that's great. But now how do we back that up? So how we treat them, how we pay them, the perks, the time, the effort into uh, helping them. You know, in fact, we were one of the first uh, in the state um, to start uh, a program called the Dream Manager. And I literally hired a six figure, he's a former vice president of another company that sold uh, to a public for a lot of money Mm -hmm. um, to be our Dream Manager. And the the idea is there's a, uh, what's his name, Kelly, Uh, I'm trying to blank on the author. If you look up the dream manager, is it Tom Kelly, maybe? Um, but the idea behind the book is B&G, or our business, Wingman would be your dream, Tom. Mm-hmm. So do your employees have dreams of their own? Sure. 
And the answer is, yeah, maybe they forgot about them. Maybe the, you know, maybe they're doing them on the side or whatever, but lots of people have dreams and goals. They just might not be doing it. And so the idea behind the dream manager is when you connect with employees and help understand what are their goals and dreams they have, and you can help them achieve them, you're building a relationship and loyalty that's very rare. And so the, the idea for us was we had someone that would sit down with their employees. Maybe it was, I want to lose weight. Maybe it was, I want to buy a house. I want to have a child. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to visit a foreign country. I want to do this trip. I want to get out of debt. I want to, maybe it's, I want to start my own business. That means we might lose a good employee. The commitment was, we want to know what your dreams and goals are and how can we help you. And so that person's whole goal was to connect with them and then help them establish a, plan, a path and actually have a plan to actually execute on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how was the was, success in that program? It was good. You know, um, you know, I think we probably had about half that had a meeting. We probably of that had another half that then engaged in weekly calls and a lot of them achieved those goals. You're not going to, you know, some people are like, I'm good. I know what I want. I'm doing, I don't want to talk to someone. That's fine. Yep. But I think even the idea that we offer it, yeah, it's cool. even the people that didn't do it, they're like, that's pretty awesome that you guys had that. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we had people that got married, had kids, bought their first house, lost weight, learned a different language, did the <clears> trip <throat> they've been dreaming about. So we saw real results, which is pretty cool. And for me, again, it's, I love helping people. I loved helping business owners. Mm -hmm. I loved it. So it was a way to invest into our employees and level them up that even if they weren't with us that long, hopefully what they learned with us helped them and they can look back in time and like, man, that was, that was amazing. That's you know? awesome. <clears throat> That's really cool. Yeah. And so and what I've realized, it's so funny because I feel like it's stuff that's so simple <clears throat> that we all know, but people just forget to follow up with action is people want to be valued. Mm hmm. If you're married, your spouse wants to be valued. Your kids want to be valued. Your customers want to be valued. Your employees want to be valued. And it takes time and effort. You can't just cheat your way to it. And so it take, it's harder, it takes more time, it takes more intent. But I think the results uh, speak for themselves. And so, you know, I told people, we, the reality is we had a team <clears throat> about what, 130 employees at the time we sold, like I had a team full of people that would run through a wall for me. I didn't throw them through walls. Oftentimes these bigger corporations, it's all about money. Well, it's because they make it all about money. Yeah. It's not about relationships, it's not about value, it's about bottom line and that's all they focus on. And what they lose in that <clears throat> is people actually really giving a crap. Yeah, definitely, you're absolutely and, right. And it's, I'm gonna do the minimal amount I can, I'm gonna figure out, figure out how to minimize the amount of time and effort and maximize the amount of money I can get out of this place. And sure. the moment I can get a better uh, opportunity somewhere else that makes that equation better, I'm gonna go. There is no loyalty because they don't give them any. There is no relationship because they haven't spent the time to build it. And it actually, I believe, hurts them financially. Mm -hmm. Because we pay people good. They could have, with our talented people, maybe made more money some other places. But the way we treated them and the value is more. In fact, <laughs> I get a lot of calls from people now um, that want to come back and like, Brady, when are you doing your next thing or when do you have an opening? And they're willing and they're wanting. It's like, I would work, take less even to get into one of your new startups because I just want to work with you. I want to feel valued. I want to be a part of a team that's doing something I respect and I stand behind. Yeah. And so it's like. It's a great feeling. That's a great feeling yeah, of, of a culture like, you built. Yeah, and, and this is where the problem when you get in private equity, when you get financial people that that's all they care about and they think they can just do that, they're missing it. And then customer service sucks, your sales suck, and everything starts going down and the only reason they're still around is because they have so much money they bought up the competition. But that's where as consumers, we see it. We see it when a company is ran that way. It's like, man, I can't get anywhere. No one's responding to service or support. This no. company's trash, Yeah. right? So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it actually being able to see now, it gives me that much more confidence into what we built was right because we made the Inc. 5000 list seven years in a row. That's They're great. Fastest growing companies without private equity money. Yep, sure. You know, and so we had a great culture. We had raving fans and we made money. And so it's, uh, yeah, so I actually have more confidence now than ever that what we were doing was definitely the way to go about it, um, to build longevity, 
um, an opportunity. And so we ended up, you know, as we built these relationships, payment <clears throat> processing turned into web development because people wanted us to help them grow their business and <clears throat> doing payments. The more web development we did, the more money they made, the more money we made because we helped grow their business. So if their sure. business grew by double, now we're processing twice as much money. Win-win. And uh, then that led into point of sale systems because we wanted to get more integrated into the bar, restaurant, hospitality business to help them run operations and gift cards and rewards programs and, you know, delivery and online ordering and all of the above. And we all of a sudden were more integrated and had more value we could provide. And, you know, that led into marketing services. And then, you know, then insurance. Hey, we've been helping you build your business. Now, why don't we help you protect it? Insurance is a commodity. It's not sexy or fun. Yeah. It's kind of a necessary thing we need to have. So you want someone you can trust and get adequate insurance for like the best price, but you also want to make sure like if you need something, someone's there for you. So sure. relationship sell. You know, so just all of these things weren't because that was my dream or passion. It was I loved helping people. I loved helping entrepreneurs. And we just became problem solvers of how do we do this faster, more efficiently? Uh, how do we provide more value with whatever the cost of the service is and find those niches? And uh, even now, you know, post sale where, you know, I've got a lot more capital. A lot of what I'm doing is leadership, strategic thinking, connections. Uh, you know, sometimes it's our capital now. We can solve problems with, with money, right? But some things are still just understanding how you scale a business. How do you create... Uh, you know, we, we teach EOS traction. You know, have you read the book Traction? Yes. By, you know, Wickman. Yes. So we teach EOS to a lot of these businesses because it's just a real effective way to run meetings, to communicate with your team, have responsibility, accountability, and to get traction, to actually execute a vision. And, you know, if you do it right, there's always accountability to get things done or address the problem that needs to be addressed. So um, I even, I mean, my wife and I, we, we've got six kids. We run EOS in our life. Like Brandy, like where do we want to be in 10 years? Where do we want our family to look like? What's yeah. our day look like? Okay, well, let's break it down into a three year, a one year. We're like, what are we doing to have our goals? You know, and so to, to meet with your spouse, to have a vision and a plan, you know, because without a plan, you're going to end up somewhere in 10 years. You know, don't you want to have an idea of what that look is and what that looks like? Sure. So, yeah, that's fun. So a lot of my time now is spent, you know, uh, I'm not in a lot of the businesses. I'm just doing a lot more uh, coaching. Sure, sure. Is what I would say. You and know, how do you uh, like that? How do you like that now? I love it other than still bandwidth and time. I'm enjoying being with my kids. I take my kids to school every day. I pick them up. I was just at, they're building a brand new school. My kids will move in over Christmas break. Actually, this is the logo for Capstone, the school. So right. I'm now the head of athletics there. It's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I'm donating my time, right? It's, uh, I'm thankful to get to help, but I get to build out the whole sports program for the school. Um, Great. And I'm just like, man, I get to mix my faith my kids, my kids' friends, their peers. I get to help a school build what I would consider a high-performing team that has fun and, you know, it's not just winning, it's how you compete, how you win, how you lose. How do you teach that? Um, that should help them build some healthy relationships with, you know, uh, competition and competing sure. and having yeah. passion but not fall apart when things don't go your way. Those are life skills that will translate to being an adult, being an entrepreneur, or being a, a member on someone else's team to play your role. You know, that's what I love about youth sports if it's done properly. You know, the culture can really help simulate life experiences to then coach the kids through that will get them ready to, you know, being a high performing, successful, happy adult. That's great. That's great. And now, and now um, um, the BNG team, so a couple of years back, you, you sold. Yeah, so we sold September of 21, and then I was on for about two years. Um, so I've just been off a little, gosh, a little over a year now. I've been officially, like, unemployed. I had about a, you know, stayed on for about two years or now yeah. type of a deal. Yeah. Um, and now, when, what made you get to that point? Like, how did you, like, did, was there a, was there a, a moment that you said, like, t to you and your partners, like, I think it's the right time or how did that come well, about? It was a, yeah, it was a long grind. We knew the software play, Connect Booster was a big play. We knew that the plan was to eventually exit and mm -hmm. we felt like the, the FinTech mark was so hot for so long, the numbers and valuations were just crazy 
And so we didn't know how long it could keep going. And so kind of the stars aligned, we were pushing off. We had people wanting to buy us for probably five years. We had tons of people reaching out. And we kind of uh, went for it. And by the way, when we sold was the literal like tip of the spear of the fintech valuations. If you go, you can pull up any chart, Google it. September of 21 was the peak and then it dropped. So we sold at the absolute perfect time and maximize our value. If we would have sold six months later, a year later, we might have gotten, you know, two thirds or even half the value. Yeah. And so now when, right. when you were looking at different players that in, in this space that to take you over, like, was there, how, did you guys, how did you guys think about that? How did you think about well, who the we, right we fit were strategic. was? I mean, we moved the money for the technology industry, right? Like we were moving billions of dollars in the tech space. We integrated with the tools. We kind of had good rapport. Like I bet you half our customers were Facebook friends of mine. When I say <laughs> like we had North Dakota support, a lot of these companies outsourced to other countries and their support's just not very good. Yeah. They can barely understand them. They don't understand the solution. So when they called us and it was, Brady and Tom and Trevor and Colton from Fargo, North Dakota, and they knew their business and they, they really cared. Like we had great support, award winning yeah. support. And you know, people got to know us as people and we'd go to the conferences and shows. And so, you know, it was um, just how we built the company. You know, um, we, were, we were the standard, if you want to say the golden child in payments for the tech space, but that's, that's what we were. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now your most of your team ended up going with the new company, right? They, they took yeah, the team? Yeah, we, we moved. So they really wanted the payment part. So we had separated like design, you know, with Dan and then we kind of, you know, shut that down. We ended up, you know, that's where it's like, we found you. It's like, let Tom handle it. So when people come to us for web stuff, we send it to you because they know they're going to be taken care of. That's what matters to me. Um, you know, on point insurance, we had separated um you know donor doc we had separated um so they really took over bng payments connect booster and bng point of sale that stayed and those people stayed there so yep so what's next for you you know right now it's it's trying to help uh build the school uh build the sports culture program for my kids we we own a you know we own mission homes we're building about 50 60 houses a year we want to ramp that up to about 100 houses a year great we're flipping 50 to 60 houses a year just in Fargo. Buy them, fix them up, flip them. Um, we're buying land, so we're gonna start doing, getting into maybe some land development. Um, Slick City, we're gonna be opening. We own the North Dakota, Omaha, and South Dakota uh, territories. For Slick City, it's an indoor slide park. Sure. We're just investing, you know, investing a lot of real estate land. Um, donor Doc is a nonprofit CRM that for donor management. That's scaling and growing. That could be like the next Connect Booster. You know, it's in, you know, it's like year four of Connect Booster. It's very, very similar. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Nash Capital is what I'm using to invest into some of these companies. I kind of have enough stuff now. I just need to support the businesses we have. And they're all so young, get them to mature and become profitable where I'm not just having to write checks to fund them all. But it'd be great. Um, but I, get I want to be a super present dad. Like, it, I, like, so here's the thing that I'll leave for the viewers and we'll wrap up. Um, for about two decades, my entire journey has been meeting with entrepreneurs from small startups in North Dakota to medium-sized businesses, <clears throat> to large companies, to multi-billion dollar companies. I've done consulting all 50 states. And the reason I say that is it's not because I'm so smart. It's my access and what I spend about 100 hours a week doing was being around other business owners. So even if you're slow, you're going to learn something. And what I can tell you after that amount of those amount of reps, and I ask questions. So when I'm talking to the 50, the 60, the 70, the 80 year old entrepreneur that has made millions of dollars in some cases, billions, what you do right, what you do wrong, do you have any regrets? The number one thing that I would hear was the regret was not another business deal. It was relationships. And number one was relationships to their kids. It was time they missed out on or their kids are really messed up and they were never around. Second was spouse or ex-spouse. Is relationships, not money. And so when I see that in my mind and my heart, I know that. It was Brady, you're in a unique position. You know, I'm 38 now. We were, you know, I was 35 when we sold. I'm like, Brady, you don't have to do anything. 
you can check the box and be super present. You're in a unique position. Don't waste it. Don't just get sucked into doing business all the time. I love business. There's a part of me, I can work 100 hours a week. I love it. Like, I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to it. But I love my family. And I could spend all the time with them. So I really wish, you know, I could like divide myself because there's two Brady's that could do, you know, different things. So I'm trying to, you know, live a very integrated life, but I want to be intentional. And so my kids are young once. I always hear people miss that. And so I'm really trying to be purposeful and not miss it. You know, but I love business. So things are building. I'm building mm -hmm. buckets. I've got good people in place. I'm not as hands-on involved. I'm using maybe my experience, my wisdom, my relationships and resources to help. But at some point when my kids grow up, I could see working with them if they have some entrepreneur, you know, interest or a business um, or go back and drive some of my own stuff, you know, more hands on in the future. But right Why now, do you kids at a young age have an entrepreneurial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. But, you know, that's also not probably by accident. I mean, I pay my kids to read books, leadership books, business books. I pay them 10 cents a page. I don't pay them to do chores. I pay them to invest into themselves. So. You know, rich dad, poor dad, cash flow quadrant, uh, think and grow rich, how to win friends and influence people. There's a lot of more, there's a bunch of books that are more kid friendly versions of those. I've had them read and uh, yep. yeah, it's just helping to train their mindset and how they view the world now. That's great. You know? What are your partners up to from uh, the B&G days? Ryan and I are partnering a lot of stuff. We bought Tyler a couple years before the sale. You know, he moved away and he's got got married and he's got a couple of kids, kind of doing his own thing. I think some real estate and some consulting. Um, Ryan and I still do most of our stuff together. Good. I got a buddy, my uh, a good buddy of mine, Derek Brandenburg, uh, Andrew Abernathy, that we're doing a lot of stuff, building storage units, um, building some car washes in Alaska. Alaska. Uh, own some grocery stores, the real estate. Um, I'm trying to like, how do you be a good steward with the capital, do it tax efficiently, have it yep. grown without it taking up my time. And then, you know, we're still, the company that bought us, I'm still a large shareholder. So at some point if they go public or they sell to a private, you know, I sell like 30 million shares. Um, so I hope they do really well because one day I can have another windfall and invest some of that capital you know, into the school, our kids, or yep. philanthropic stuff, so. Fantastic, I, I love what you've done. I, you know, I've, I met you um, probably in 2020, um, and we did some, we, we did a bunch yeah. of jobs together. I helped some of your clients, you helped some of my clients, and you know, uh, I worked closely with Dan and Jesse um, yeah. to, you know, make sure that our clients had great processing for the e-commerce sites, like you were talking about. And then, you know, you guys sent designs over to us to take care of for your customers who needed design and development work. Yeah. Yep. So it's pretty cool. It was, it, it, was, it was great to, you know, there was a time where I was getting two and three leads a week from you guys, and uh, I was sending two or three leads a week for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. it was, good. In, it was a good time, thing. Tom, in time. We'll see what the future holds. Perfect. All right. Well, it was great to uh, catch up with you today. I'm glad we got to do this. I feel like the um, visitors are going to, the, the viewers of Grit Won't Quit are going to enjoy this one because, you know, it started with the same hustle that every entrepreneur starts with. And you had a nice, uh, you had a great exit. You're young and you're uh, going to continue to do great things. Thanks. I appreciate you and your, your friendship and uh, your time today. Awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Be well and have a great weekend. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye-bye.